Welcome to Life on the Rock. And tonight on the show we have Catholic Gators. Not alligators, yeah. but the University of Florida Gators <laughs> from dan Gainesville. A dangerous show tonight. A dangerous show. We have Father <laughs> David Ruchinski and Tanya Borsellino. And they're going to be sharing their faith. They're doing incredible work down there uh, with the students. 10,000 Catholics at the University of Florida. And they are really evangelizing and doing great work. So we're happy to have them on the yeah. show. Doug. Padre. How you been? Very good. How are you? Anything coming up in the world of Battle Ready? Uh, Battle Ready Rally Tours uh, throughout, coming up, uh, yes, this Lent um, are rampant, especially in Wisconsin, Indiana, uh, Minnesota. Yeah, a bunch of them coming up. And uh, so very, very thankful. A lot of people opening the door. Last year we did 52 Battle Ready rallies across the country. Wow. We will be close to 40 by the end of Lent. Wow. Yeah, wow. I mean, just the response has been, wow. thanks be to God, uh, wonderful. A um, couple of bishops are, are, getting, um, are getting in tune with this as well. Mm -hmm. The idea, again, to elevate the conversation to spiritual warfare, <clears throat> you know, on the day-to-day -day basis that we are all, all in, involved in, we can't take lightly. Out of sight, out of mind, inside, mm -hmm. in mind. That's what the Battle Ready Rallies are about. I also have a new DVD, Battle Ready Live. It's a live recording of a Battle Ready Rally. Um, some great uh, quotes from scripture and saints and, and popes and such that we've inserted in there to help people. Uh, really understand that this is not, you know, just some terminology to rile up the, the heart. This is the church's teaching from, mm -hmm. you know, paragraph 4 and 9 of the Catechism that we are in dour combat with the forces of evil, Ephesians 6, 12, 1 Peter 5, 8, you know, uh, Pope, saints, you name it. So uh, Battle Ready Live, you can get off battlereadystrong.com, our website, and, uh, and pass it around. And we've lowered the price on it. We're doing quantity discounts because we want to get this out to people. While there's still time, and I don't mean that in some apocalyptic way, every single life we've got to get to, by the grace of God, while we're breathing. So while there's still time, let's reach as many as we can, which is what tonight's show's about. They're doing great work. Mission 10,000 we're going to be talking about, the Florida Gators down there. They're on fire, mm -hmm. and uh, they're in fuego. They cannot be contained. Mm -hmm. And so we, we're going to highlight that for them tonight. All right. And uh, I, I just want to say a quick little thing about our Holy Father recently gave a homily at, at uh, St. Martha's house, and he drew from uh, 1 Timothy 4.12, and he says, Let no one despise your youth. So this is Paul writing to Timothy, bishop to bishop. But set the believers an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity till I come. Attend to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have which was given you by prophetic utterance when the elders laid their hands upon you. And that's the thing I wanted to center on tonight, the gift of faith. That's what he centers on mm -hmm. in his homily. And it's a, it's a precious thing that we need to stir up with prayer, as he says, uh, being, uh, attending to the preaching and teaching. And, and he, the Holy Father centers in on how it's mm -hmm. a gift to us from the Holy Spirit, but also it comes to us through others in our life. Paul himself will cite of uh, Timothy's grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice as giving them, giving him that faith, that same faith that burned in them is also resides in Timothy. So he says, faith is a gift. Faith cannot be studied. We study the truths of the faith in order to understand it better, but faith is never reached by studying. Faith is a gift to the Holy Spirit. It's a gift which goes beyond any preparation. Remember where your faith, he quotes, uh, Paul, remember where your faith comes from, who gave it to you, the Holy Spirit, through your mother and grandmother, speaking to Timothy. So it's this precious thing we mm. need to protect, and it's a treasure, and that we stir up into flame through prayer and mm -hmm. through receiving that word uh, from others. Yeah, because it's necessary. It's necessary to have that faith to, to fight the good fight, as we see in Timothy, wage the good mm -hmm. warfare, fight the good fight. Um, and, and, and faith is, is, is what gives us you know, the, the, the interior substance to do it. Mm -hmm. Without faith, it's just, it, what, we do it for practical reasons, we do it for, 
you know, profit. No, we do it because it is what is right. And again, it's that gift that you talk about. It, it, and it must be treasured and it must be nurtured because a lot of people, you can have faith, you can lose it. Mm -hmm. You can lose your faith. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can start to not believe in the, in the truth and the teachings that God has given us through the Catholic faith. And we've got to protect it. We've got to nurture it. We've got to fight to defend it. Right. And Father and, and Tanya tonight, you know, show us, witness to us the importance of evangelization and how, yes, we guard that deposit of faith, but when we share it, it grows. Mm. And that's a, I think that's a real turning point for a lot of us in our spiritual lives is not to just always be focused on ourselves, but to start looking towards others, how can we live this in a better way? How can we share this with mm -hmm. others? And I think sometimes that's what we're missing in our spiritual lives, mm -hmm. you know, for real maturity. So I think uh, tonight this show witnesses to that in an excellent way with the work they're doing at the University of Florida. So we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in just a moment with the University of Florida Gators uh, Catholic Center. Don't go away. Back in a moment. Welcome back to Lamp on the Rock. I'm Doug Barry, along with Father Mark. We are the Rock House Compadres. You are with us in the Rock House, which is the most important place you could be at this time. We want to thank our guests for being here. We have Father David, and you are a pure Polish man. Mom and Dad, both Polish. Yep. Incredible. Pronounce your name for us, probably? R Ruchinski. Ruchinski. Yes. Yes. You're going to see it with an accent, though, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, I'm, I'm American. I'm <laughs> American. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Tanya Borsolito. Yes. There you Hi. go. All right. <laughs> And you are from Florida. Yes. The Florida Gators. Yep. The town of Gainesville, not Tallahassee. No. no. That's a different school. <laughs> we don't want to talk about that no. right now. <laughs> Gainesville. Okay. All right. Chomp, chomp. <laughs> okay. Uh, but you're not here to talk about football or any other sports activities necessarily. We're here to talk about something much more important. Uh, what brings you here, though? Let's, let's go. Let's get a little, little background first and foremost. Um, how long have you been a priest, Father? Uh, I was ordained in 2007. Okay. Yeah. And... Uh, the University of Florida, the University Parish was my first assignment. Okay. But you are not from there. You are? Originally from Ohio. Ohio State Buckeyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a urban Meyer, you see. There you go. <laughs> you guys really, really shook up the country this year with the old playoff thing there. Coming out of nowhere, leapfrogging into the Final Four and then taking it all the way to the end. Yeah. Yeah. How Pretty about cool. that? Yeah, but that's football. It really doesn't matter that much. <laughs> uh, Tanya, tell yes. us about yourself. Where are you from? I am from Boca Raton, Florida. Okay. So like four hours away from the University of Florida. Mm -hmm. I am one of two children and I was born and raised in the church, grew up in the choirs, altar serving. Okay, okay. Visually, yes. you were born and raised in the church. So, <laughs> and then yeah. you grew up in the choir? Yeah. Wow. Is that, <laughs> did I get, am I getting this right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you grew up Catholic yes. then? Yes, yeah. Okay, and when, what year are you at the university then? I'm a sophomore. Sophomore. Mm -hmm. What are you studying now? Telecommunications. Telecommunications. Yeah. Well, appropriate for you to be yes. on a television network. Yeah, being seen right. by millions of people all over the world yeah. right now. But no nerves, right? No nerves. No, very excited no. about this. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Father, your, your, uh, your, your passion, of course, is a priest, um, but now you're at the university. I think God calls priests specifically to do certain ministry work, especially university work. Yeah, sure. Because you're dealing with a very unique time period in, in a young adult's life. Mm -hmm. And you're getting students from all over places, you know, different parts of the country, especially locally and such in the state. And they're coming in just out of high school a lot of times. And they're going through all kinds of changes and all kinds of new challenges and tests and struggles. Um, what's that like first and foremost as a priest that interacts with young adults at that level, at a college level? You know, sometimes people will ask me, yeah, did you learn anything new, discover anything uh, that, about the priesthood that you, uh, you know now that you didn't know when you were going through seminary or when you were first ordained? And one of them was about the spiritual fatherhood of, of the priest. Mm. Uh, I, I can remember going through seminary thinking that fatherhood was something that I was going to have to sacrifice uh, in order to be a priest. 
and and I thought, well, okay, you know, it makes sense. It's for a, for a good cause, for a good mission. God's going to be able to use my life, so the the practical gift of my celibacy uh, will enable me to be a more effective priestly uh, presence. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and what I've discovered in ministering to all of these young people is how generous God is in giving back to us. Mm -hmm. Uh, sort of shaken down and flowing over. It's like, you know, uh, his superabundant gift of all these children, mm -hmm. that if I had been a father on the natural order, I wouldn't, you know, I would have, uh, maybe I would have had uh, 10 kids and everybody would have gone, wow, isn't that incredible? You have mm -hmm. 10 kids. What a great big Catholic family. Mm -hmm. I have hundreds of children. And to be able to experience in this ministry that, uh, that fatherhood on such a deep and satisfying, a, a, a real level, right. that's been, uh, that's been a, a great gift. So, that, I mean, in, in a priest in this situation, as any priest who really takes seriously their role when, when God entrusts lives and souls to them, but you've got these young adults and they're making, you know, um, decisions that are really earth shattering for sometimes, you mm -hmm. know, earth life changing. Yeah, for sure. Know, what they're gonna do and where they're gonna go. And there has to be a certain pain that goes with that when you see certain decisions made. You see some stray away. Mm -hmm. You know you've had some in the faith and they're coming to church regularly and then they drift off. And, and what's that like to experience that, that loss or that struggle knowing that these lives, some of these choices are not good and you see them drifting and hurting? Yeah, well it certainly, it gives us a great incentive to want to get out there. I mean we know, you know, they're, if the 10,000 Catholics that there are on the University of Florida, um, if, if we don't reach out to them, less than 20%, you know, less than 2,000 will still be practicing their faith mm -hmm. by the time they get out of college four years later. That's statistical information kind of backs it up all over the place. Uh, so we know that, that we lose them and we can see, we're right there on the, the University Avenue, all the bars, all the clubs, all the, uh, I can stand in back of my church on any given, really any given night, you'd just say weekends, but no, any given night and watch as the people, you know, come walking down, you know, uh, girls uh, with a group of their friends, guys with a group of their friends, going to the bars and then you can come back a little bit later and you see them paired up and going the other direction, mm -hmm. staggering and falling into the gutter. So, I mean, like it's, it's uh, to be right in the thick of it, uh, we can see what the alternative way of living is uh, and, and what that leads to, uh, you know. So this is, I mean, you're, you're standing there literally in the battlefield, yeah. watching the choices, the behavior take place right there before your eyes. Mm -hmm. And we know this goes on all over. And this really, I guess, highlights and, and, and puts a spotlight on the reality that this is a is a spiritual battle and decisions that we make affect and the consequences mm -hmm. are, are serious and have, you know, there's eternal aspect of these as well, you know, um, and how serious that is to, 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 to bring to light. And Tanya, for you as a college student who's in the thick of this as yeah. well, um, what are you doing, first of all, what are you doing within the, within the, the Newman Center down there in this mission work, what is your role down there? You're not just a student that Father said, hey, you want to go hang out on Life on the Rock? Right, night? right. Yeah, let's go out the week. What is it that you do now that brings you here tonight? I'm a student leader, so I'm one of the very many student leaders who um, get together and are a part of different ministries. So I'm a part of Catholic Student Fellowship. Every Thursday we have different events going on, different speakers speaking on topics, like the bishop coming to speak on vocations and what being uh, religious is or what it means to to us as people, I mean. Uh, so I'm a part of that and I'm also a part of a little bit of part of the music ministry, part of retreats, so kind of doing a little bit of everything. Any time for studies and anything else? <laughs> that comes, that comes <laughs> with it. It's t managing your time. Right. Yeah. Right. So, okay, so Father describes what he sees on mm -hmm. this, this battlefield, so to speak, of, of these young adults and the decisions being made. What do you see being within the group of peers? What's it like for you knowing and seeing people? And you're just an example. You're, you're one of yeah. many college students across the country. But what's that like for you as a young adult to see the choices being made one way or the other? And knowing the consequence and seriousness of what's behind it. Mm -hmm. as, as Father mentioned in the beginning segment about the gift of faith and the importance to preserve it and nurture it. What's it like for you from your, your perspective? 
it's amazing. It's amazing to be a student leader to see other students who are growing in their faith, who are willing to go to daily mass, who are willing to consecrate themselves to Jesus through Mary or pray the liturgy of the hours. That's amazing in itself, but it's also incredibly um, driving to see the other students who do different things, like go to the bars, go to the clubs, and who are searching for a family, who are searching for love and the reality of what our lives are for and to be able to be that person that goes to them and brings them to that light and to the answer, the truth, that's incredible too. But something has to be in a young uh, adult, a young person like yourself, to want to reach out and go to them. And, and you see many students, father, that, uh, that are like Tanya that want to do that? Yeah, actually, we've seen uh, we've seen a lot of students just kind of coming on in just the last few years. Uh, uh, it's it's really it's uh, it's incredible. We uh, I'm I'm just blessed to work with a phenomenal group of of student leaders. When I got there, it was a fairly small number. I remember uh, getting a list uh, in that first year. We had 27 students involved in leading the various pieces of the ministry, and. Uh, uh, and now we've got over 130 of them, uh, just five years later. Wow. Uh, and uh, those um, those students are not only uh, committed personally to living living out their faith through, as Tanya mentioned, through prayer, through the sacramental life, through uh, through lives of service uh, for others. Um, but then you know they. They just have this this zeal and this passion for mm -hmm. sharing, and they commit themselves to going deeper and deeper in their formation. We have what we call our ministry formation program uh, on Wednesday nights from 10 to 11:30. Uh, all of these student leaders uh, commit themselves to a four-semester-long program mm. to grow in their understanding, their knowledge, their and their skill in sharing the faith. So they take uh, they do a semester on prayer because we think prayer is the foundation of mm -hmm. everything. Uh, then they do a semester on evangelization. They do a semester on salvation history, because we find that a lot of times when they're going out to try and share the faith, particularly their Catholic faith, uh, they will get confronted by other Christians, uh, Protestant Christians, who know the Bible better than they think they know the Bible, mm -hmm. you know, better than, you know, and, and as soon as they, they feel kind of, uh, you know, challenged on, on, you know, well, where's the biblical basis for this? Well, then, you know, they sometimes they kind of, right. you know, they fall back, right? So, uh, so really giving them that, that big biblical narrative and saying, you know, you, you actually know more about scripture than you think, uh, and here's how it all fits together. Uh, and then finally, we finish out with a course on, uh, on Acts of the Apostles. Sometimes people say, well, why, like of all the things, why you pick that one particular book? But the rationale is the Acts of the Apostles, they call it the gospel of the Holy Spirit or the gospel of the church. And it's really sort of an unfinished work mm. uh, in some ways. You know, you get to the end of Acts of the Apostles and the, 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 there's Paul kind of just sitting there, house arrest, all that kind of thing. Uh, the, the story doesn't have a completion because the story is ongoing, isn't mm. it, right? The, the gospel of the church is the gospel of today. What is the good news of the church today, of what the Holy Spirit is doing today, mm -hmm. of how that gospel message is being spread out onto the, 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 for, the far corners of the mm -hmm. world today, like university campuses, which frankly uh, are, are some of the furthest, <laughs> furthest away that you right. can get from, uh, from the message of the gospel. Well, and that brings up my next question is, you know, what, what is it that the young people are dealing with today, young adults, you know, and in some ways much, much harsher in it than it ever has been with regards to certain liberal mentalities, if you want to call it that, really secularism in general. Mm -hmm. It's really overtaken a lot of areas, um, percentages of those who actively go into church and so forth. Like you said, they, they, they will dwindle, they'll fall into this, unless we're actively out there um, preserving that faith we talked about in the first segment. And really, we're missionary by baptism. I mean, we're called to be missionaries by baptism. It's, it's not something we necessarily have the option to choose. It's option to respond to what we're supposed to do, right, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. But in some way, shape, or form, we're called to be out there and be in the streets, literally or figuratively at least, preaching and evangelizing, are we not? Yeah, absolutely. 
um, you know, when you when you talked about the being out in the streets, literally or, or figuratively, mm -hmm. uh, just it calls to my mind uh, something that that uh, an initiative that got started quite recently. Um, uh, it's called Night Fever, and we didn't uh, originate this idea, but we put it in place there. There we are, right on the, you know, as I said, in the thick of things, all the bars and clubs up and down the the the, the street there, where uh, University Avenue, and uh, we said, well, what if we were to stand out in front of the church, open up the doors, put in, put candles that lead up the aisle uh, to Jesus, exposed on the altar in the monstrance, praise and worship music, the the lighting, all of it focuses mm. uh, on the beauty of Christ in the Eucharist. And just stand out there and as people are passing by, hand them a little tea light and say, hey, would you be willing to go inside and take five minutes and light a candle and say a prayer? You would not believe the responsiveness mm -hmm. of people to that simple initiative. Wow. I was in there uh, kneeling and praying while all of this was going on one time. I thought, oh, man, there's a line you know, of people backed up halfway down the aisle of the, the main aisle of the church to, to go in. And these are, these are people who, when they left the house that night, they had no intention of stepping yeah. into a church. And, and these are just college students like yourself, yeah. Tanya? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you were asking what drives student leaders to go out and to bring people in. At Night Fever, I was bringing someone in and they said, this is beautiful, I don't deserve this. And right when that person said that, something clicked in my head saying, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm here because everyone does deserve to know who the Lord is, to have all this love and to see this beauty and like that answer showed me that this is why I'm doing what I'm well, doing. That, that reminds me like everybody has a right to the faith mm -hmm. and when they come to a Christian they have a right, they demand faith from us, they expect that from us and we have a duty to give them faith. Yeah. That, that's a beautiful story. And, and that you're really snapped, You're snatching them out of the jaws <laughs> yeah, exactly. of the gator. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that's actually a, a real key moment of, of the spiritual fight where someone would would feel almost that whisper, if you will, from the enemy saying, you don't deserve yeah. this, you shouldn't be here, mm -hmm. you're too bad, you're this, you're that, you're whatever, it's not important. Whatever the temptation is, the whisper in the ear that just simply says, just stay out of this place, knowing the danger against the enemy of being in the presence of God and having people just reach out and invite. Yeah. And that's what's so beautiful about it. We're going to run to a break right now. When we come back, we're going to get more into what you're all doing out there in Gatorland. Uh, something in particular called Mission 10,000. You're going to want to hear this and uh, know more about it. So don't go away. We will be back after this break. Welcome back to Life in the Rock. I'm Doug Berry along with Father Mark. We are the Rock House Compadres, the only Rock House Compadres on the planet, I should say, by the way, just so you all know that. Mm -hmm. We're here today with uh, Father David Ruchinski and Tanya Borsellino, yeah. sophomore at the University of Florida Gator <laughs> Land in Gainesville. Yeah. And you are, are you the pastor at the Newman Center there? Are you the I'm, I'm the director of the student center. Okay, you are the top dog. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hesitated before I said dog because you're a priest. I didn't mean it that way. Uh, you're the top gator. We'll call it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, you know, we're going to set up a video here in just a moment uh, from Christophonic that I think ties in very well with this Mission 10,000. And what we're talking about here is really the active program and the, really the strategy that you talked about before the show, which I thought was fantastic, we really want to get into, of really forming and, you know, these young people and getting them out there. And you call it um, finding, forming, launching, is that correct? That's it. Yeah, find them, form them, launch them, get them out there. They need to be aware of the battle, prepare for the battle, and then get out there and engage in the battle. It's my battle-ready thing. Right? I like Aware, prepare, engage. Mm -hmm. So, same idea. All right, we're on the same page, Father. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chomp, chomp. chomp. <laughs> yeah. But uh, there's something powerful, not just because it's good for them to do it, but because we are battling some things in this world, especially in our country now, that are, that are a, a, a bit more uh, concerning, right? in that if we don't do anything, we are gonna get chomped. But we know that if we respond to the grace of God, 
we can win this, we can turn this tide. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got intrusion of the government in different areas, we've got religious freedoms under attack, we see divorce, we see addiction to pornography is on the rise, we see um, everything from abortion, birth control use, and so forth. We see this attack on the dignity of life and marriage and family. This is the devil's attack, we know this. It's the culture of death, as you know, St. John Paul II talked about. But we also see a rise in uh, euthanasia, uh, in youth, euthanistic type attitudes. And I know that that's, that's something, you're, you know, Tanya, your, your generation's really gonna have to deal with on a different level. We have a great video we're gonna go to here uh, that Chris Stefanik has done. Chris has been on the show several times. Um, you know, he's just a great guy, does great work. We're gonna show this video and come back and then we can, we can springboard from this into some of the work that Mission 2000 is involved in and you can really lay it out, the strategy that you've got going down there in Gatorland. Check out this video, very important. Take a few moments and check this out. I'm Liz, a sister, a wife, a mom of four, and I'm living with advanced, incurable kidney cancer. That's the page I'm on right now. I live in Oregon where it'd be legal for me to end my life, but I can't do that. People are calling euthanasia death with dignity. The moment we label suicide an act of dignity, we've implied that people like me are undignified for not ending our lives, or worse, or a costly burden for society. What a lonely, uncharitable, and fake world we live in if we think it's somehow undignified to let people see us suffer, to love us and care for us to the end. I hate cancer. I hate cancer. And I don't surrender to the things I hate. Cancer might take my life, but I'm gonna live until I die, and I'm gonna fight until I die. That's dignity. Statistically, my odds are bleak. But I won't call it quits because I'm not a statistic. You see, God has the final word in my life and death, not cancer. That's not a cute phrase, it's a fact. Miracles happen every single day. There are countless people walking around who are supposed to have died years ago. And that's a possibility worth sticking around for. You know what else is worth sticking around for? Every single day I get to spend with the people I love. My life isn't a story written by cancer. It's written by love. And whenever it ends, it'll end in eternal love. And a story's end changes the meaning of every page. My life was never given to me to control it. My life isn't mine to take. It's mine to give. My life is given to me to love, to the end. Love is dignity. I'm facing death with dignity. Very powerful, wow. and um, God bless that woman. And it is part of our battle, isn't it, Father? Understanding the dignity of life, and that attack is expressed in so many ways: through euthanasia, through abortion, and even through the the hookup culture party atmosphere of just mutual usury sometimes of, of one another in this world. These are things that I know are seriously on your heart, yours as well, Tanya. And that's a lot of what Mission 10,000 is about, isn't it? To try to form and launch disciples into a culture to battle this and other forms of these attacks on dignity. Tell us your, your thoughts on, again, this, this, this attack and what Mission 10,000 is intended to do. Yeah, well, I mean, that the video just kind of highlights uh, again for me the urgency. Mm. I'm kind of a passionate guy when it comes to this mission. The people who are around me, they, they hear me <laughs> speaking with, with passion. 
Mission 10,000 is, is kind of a rallying cry. You're familiar with how important having a battle cry is right. to, to get out there and to, to, to deal with real life and death issues. Part of the deception that our students face on campus is that uh, people tend to see uh, religious preference as just kind of one of a, a, a other preferences. Well, you know, some people like uh, uh, fish and some people like uh, shrimp and some people don't, you know. Uh, what difference does it make if, if the students who come in as practicing Catholics leave nothing, nuns, you know? Uh, and the, uh, we think it really does make a life or death dis difference because what the Catholic Church has to offer, this Catholic worldview that we want to form our students in, uh, is really quite different than the worldview that's out there. Uh, and, and just to c clarify a point for the audience, you were asked that question by, by a, a student who was interviewing you for an article yeah. about what the big deal is about students who leave their faith. Yeah, yeah, so uh, there was some, uh, some uh, article, some study that came out that said that a majority of young people now identified their religion as none. Uh, and she, she starts off by saying to me, well, do you think that's a bad thing? Yes, I think that's a bad <laughs> thing. Uh, and we kind of talked a little bit about it. And she was asking, well, well, what do you think? Why? You know, I was explaining my, my, uh, my interpretation of, you know, why I see the uh, religion as a civic virtue being set aside like so many other virtues, like honesty and chastity and, and, uh, and, and other, you know, other sort of uh, good public virtues. Um, I said, but I'm not worried. She said, well, why? You know, and I said, well, because we, we know how it ends, but also we've got a strategy for how to win this, win this battle. Uh, and I said, look, if I can work with a small group of people, form them well, and get them to commit themselves to going out and finding each one of them two other people who will do the same. I said, just as a mathematical function, you can see that in a very short time, we'll take over this campus. Mm. <laughs> and this girl who'd been sitting there kind of, you know, very aloof and, and kind of like, oh yeah, 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 religion, ha, huh, you know. Suddenly, like a light, something went off in her head and she's like, you're serious. <laughs> and I am serious, yeah. right? You know, 10,000 fired up, zealous, servant-minded, prayerful, young Catholics who love the church, who love the Eucharist, who love Jesus and have a passion to share that, you launch 10,000 of those people out into the parishes and the schools and the diocese and the ministries around the state of Florida, you'll change the landscape of Florida. People think, oh, you know, all these things that are happening in our world, well, what are we going to do about it? They tend to want to shrug their shoulders. They look at, at, at the, the, the demise of family, the demise of our culture, the demise of things that are good and true and beautiful, and they kind of, they see it like it's, oh, well, it's just a natural process. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and who are we? What can we do to stop the, the tide? You can. It, like the change that could happen, this isn't like some far off, down the road, distant thing uh, that, uh, like in four years, 10,000 Catholics, they, they come to us. We can change the world by starting right there now, on that campus. As you're saying that some of this, Father, I'm, I'm catching Tanya at the corner of my eye and she's, she's grinning and smiling at some of this. It, it, does this fire you up when you hear this, Tanya? Yeah, it, it, it is a mission. This is our mission and it just makes me want to go out and tell more people about it. and. It's funny, like I laugh about it now because I never expected to be um, realizing all of this and to be so strong in my faith and wanting to learn and grow more, but it, it is a mission and we're called to evangelize and to tell people about it and we're all called to be saints, so we have to help each other out and we gotta bring each other to it. So you were, you were raised Catholic, yes. you were born in a church and grew up in a choir <laughs> loft, you understand. Exactly, yeah. Okay, right, we're gonna write that down, keep that. Put that in your book someday. Okay, but no, you were born, raised, mm -hmm. Catholic, uh, were, have you always been on fire for the faith or did some of this happen when you came to uh, the university and started hearing this priest preaching this way? What happened? How did this happen? What set you on fire? Um, my parents told me to come check out the Catholic Gators and I was kind of hesitant about it. I was like, I'm going to college. So, you know, college, 
party school, whatever. I don't know if I want that reputation of that good girl um, like I have had my whole life. So I said, okay, mom, you know, I'll make you happy. So I went and I met Father David right away and just some other student leaders and they were so kind and they met you where you were at and they were so loving and um, it was free food and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> that perfect for college students. That's always a plus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But they were just so genuine, and you felt at peace, and you felt that love. Mm -hmm. And when you're not at home, like, you're on your own. So these are the times when students have to make decisions. We're adults now, so we have the decisions to make whether we're going to choose the right ones or the wrong ones. And um, to find this place where, you know, we're guided to those right decisions on that right path to God that was... A miracle and it's great and it's uncovered this yeah. drive where I just want to go tell everybody too. Yeah, so forget the telecommunications. <laughs> just join the convent. What are you waiting for? We don't know. <laughs> 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 All right, so Mission 10,000 is really what you've titled this, this strategic move. And I like we talk, you know, the idea about strategy and you say we have a plan and we're implementing it. You know, we have, we have a strategy. We're making it happen. We're making it active. Uh, um, kind of give us the idea why mission 10,000 because of the 10,000 students but mm -hmm. kind of fill us in fill the audience in a bit more about about mission 10,000 yeah well what we what we saw when we were uh, kind of trying to break it down and say okay well what do we have here uh, kind of following the Matthew Kelly's principle about you know like find the thing that that really works mm -hmm. and just get behind it just go gung-ho about it and so um, I w began to think well what do we want to be at the center uh, uh, of this? Well, clearly we want the Eucharist at the center mm -hmm. of everything we do. Uh, if it's not, the rest of it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. okay. So how do we then, we kind of surround Christ in the Eucharist with uh, a, a small circle of people that we really invest in very, very heavily. That formation piece is, is a real, uh, it's a priority for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so everything is sort of turned toward getting them in there and forming them well uh, wh during the time that we have them. But the formation has to be structured in a way that it is, it's also future looking, mm -hmm. that we're equipping them with the things that they will need to make the transition over into the next part of their lives. So we look at, well, what, what else? What's gonna help them to bridge the gap out of our campus ministry and into parish life. Right. And uh, we identified a couple of things. For example, we said, well, probably mentorship because that's gonna be something that you can carry with you and will grow with you through a life of Catholic discipleship. Probably some small group skills and the ability to sort of pull together uh, just on your own without waiting for somebody to do it for you, uh, a small group of people that you can get together and share the faith with. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we also thought that it would be helpful to have them go out and put it into practice before they leave so that they can see that in a parish, community isn't a stratified group of uh, people who all go to the same university that I do, who all practice the same faith that I do, and who are all the same within the same four-year age span as I right, am, right? right? Now community means something different at a parish level. So how do you practice, how do you put those skills into practice when you go out there? We do this thing called PET, parish evangelization teams, where we take a group of students. Tanya's mm -hmm. one of those. Uh, who they go through a period of preparing themselves. They do a program, for, uh, a day retreat for youth. They stay over, they, they like stay with uh, parish families. Uh, they help out in the liturgies and then they're just kind of there to be present and at the service of whatever the pastor that parish needs them to do on a mm. Sunday. Wow. And their, their presence gives the people in the parish a lot of hope because they see, wow, these are college kids who are taking their weekend to go out and share the gospel. Yeah. Uh, and it's great for our kids because then it gives them that confidence that they need. And if, if things don't work, if they're talking at a level that's not gonna fly when they get out into the parishes, because they've had this good formation sure. and some of them kind of you know, take for granted, well, doesn't everybody know what the liturgy of the hours is? Doesn't everybody know how to pray using the Ignatian method of prayer uh, to, to engage the imagination and contemplation of the sacred? And, uh, 
Huh? <laughs> yeah. So, so to get him out there and say, well, you started talking about the three transcendentals of the good, the true, and the beautiful, and the, mm -hmm. the, the, the high schooler's eyes glazed over. Uh, maybe you need to work on your methodology. Sure. And, 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 uh, and so then we come back, ref we reflect on it, and we send that team out again to, to try it again. To adjust the presentation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think that yeah. is so powerful. I don't think I've ever heard any group, all the groups we've had on, I don't think I've ever heard of any of the groups going into the parish. I mean, not only are we, you're not cowering and saying, oh, what we're going to do, yeah. you're taking it out and to prepare them to live in the parish, right, when they graduate. That is so powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah, Tanya, powerful. your experience in that, is it working? It's amazing, yeah. And just to be able to show these younger uh, kids that we're college students, but we like to have fun, we're normal, but we are also on fire for our faith. And God is at the center of our lives and we're doing amazing things with that. So it's cool and it's, Awesome. Do you ever make a pasta sauce for him in the parish? No, not yet. I'll yeah. do it next time, though. <laughs> 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 uh, we're going to run to a break and we come back. We've got one more segment. We're going to get a little more detail about this. And also, you know, for those of you who might be interested in, in, you know, picking this up and running with it in your own neck of the woods, your area of the battlefield, uh, you know, maybe you contact Father and, uh, you know, get some pointers. All right, don't go away. We'll be back after this break. Welcome back to Life on the Rock. Doug Barry, along with Father Mark, the Rock House Compadres, as I mentioned earlier, the only ones on the planet. So make sure we mm -hmm. understand that to be clear. We're here with Father David Ruchinsky. Chinsky. Mm -hmm. Why am I thinking Ruchinko? Uh, I have no idea. It's a uh, Russian name, isn't it? <laughs> and, uh, and Tanya... Um, oh, Borsellino. Borsellino. <laughs> Father, you threw me off with the Italian <laughs> pasta thing, the <laughs> Italian sauce. Anyway, last segment here to have you, the Florida Gators. Yeah. Uh, nobody knew that the Florida Gators had this kind of a Catholic presence going on down there. Uh, but this is, this is incredible because this Mission uh, 10,000 is a very active, you say find them, form them, launch them. And I think if you're gonna launch anything, Florida's a good state to launch it from. Yeah. <laughs> Cape Canaveral, <laughs> <laughs> get it? Okay, <laughs> anyway, so, you know, <laughs> you know, all this makes me think about, one of my favorite stories is Pentecost. You think about Pentecost, and you think about these, these men who were in the upper room. And even after Jesus rose from the dead, you know, these guys loved Jesus. They loved our Lord, but they were scared to death. Right? They were just scared. And so he, he ascends and he says, I'm going to send the paraclete. I've got to go so he can come, you know, and he's going to change things. And it's going to make it amazing. And you have no, no idea what I'm going to do through you, you know, little cowardly, timid men right now when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you. So here they are, peeking out the doors, the windows, afraid to go out in the streets. Nine days go by, and on the tenth day of Pentecost, Holy Spirit descends. They're set on fire. Doors burst open. They cannot be contained. They're speaking different languages, going into different corners of the world with different personalities, different gifts from different backgrounds, bringing light to the different areas of darkness. And that is exactly what we're doing today, what we're called to do today. And that's what this is all about, isn't it? Absolutely. Taking the different gifts, personalities of these students, forming them, letting the Holy Spirit set them on fire, and then launching them into the world. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Wow, you ought to just come down and work for us. <laughs> 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 but but that, and that's, I love that about the strategy because the, the church has been doing this for 2,000 years. We have the history and the experience Amen. of it. The great saints mm -hmm. who preached in ways that, that raised men's hearts to the Heavenly Father, mm -hmm. lifted them to the Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what you're obviously doing with these kids here by the grace of God. Um, Father, what, what, what great stories do you have that can inspire? Because stories, they're powerful. They can inspire. When, you, when you've seen students like, like Tanya or others, you know, that have really touched your heart as a priest, seeing a student come, maybe lukewarm, just going through the motions, what have you, and then being set on fire. Yeah, I, I guess uh, one of the areas where I've seen uh, some changes that have, that inspire me and I think inspire a lot of other people is in the area of vocations, vocation discernment. Mm -hmm. um, when I got there, 
we ha we barely ever saw anybody uh, enter seminary or religious formation. And in just the last five years, we've had 23 of our Catholic gators who've entered seminary or wow. religious formation. Um, and one such story uh, is, I'll, I'm thinking about a guy who came to the University of Florida from a Catholic family, but had pretty much walked away from his faith, uh, had gotten into the fraternities and into the party scene and, uh, and had discovered the secular worldview and atheistic philosophy mm -hmm. and a really, really bright guy, loved to read, read the wrong things, started going down you know, this, this, this really, really bad spiral. Um, I don't know exactly who it was that caught him. I mean, we, like I said, we got a lot of people out there trying to find him. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually, he kind of found his way to me, and we began kind of engaging on some of these crazy ideas that he was being fed out of the university and started kind of picking them apart, going the route of the, in the intellect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the guy was studying uh, he was studying business. Uh, he actually he uh, got a, a degree in accounting and got a really, really good job uh, right out of college at a time when jobs were hard to find, uh, big money, everything. But he turned it down to become a focused missionary. Wow. Spent a year as a focused missionary, and God just wouldn't let go of his heart. After a year, contacts me. I'm the vocation director for the diocese as well. Says, I got to go. Now, he's, uh, he's finishing up his second year of theology at the seminary. Uh, this is a guy who is going to bring in a lot mm. of others. Because he's been there, right? Mm -hmm. He has been to kind of the, the, the extreme of what the secular world, especially in a university setting, what it says you ought to be living for, mm -hmm. to the extreme of uh, seeking pleasure as your fulfillment, uh, seeking the the power and the esteem of others, seeking money as the you know as the end of, of our human fulfillment, and walked away from it, um, and. Uh, and has found something, I mean, it's the, the treasure buried in the field or the sure. pearl, pearl of great price. And, and the guy who knows what the alternative is and then has found this is mm -hmm. going to be an impassioned evangelizer right. for others. Right. That's a great story. I mean, and, and it's one of how many that we just don't even know, the, you know, the, the conclusion of for so many other people. Yeah. Tanya, what about yourself? What stands out to you? with the Mission 10,000 approach and, and the parish evangelization work and the, and the little, the, the, the night fever, you mm -hmm. know, all these different things. What stands out to you is uh, impacting stories of, of lives that have really been, you know, dramatically or somewhat altered even by, by these things. It's definitely changing people's perception of what Catholicism is or what the Catholic Church is or um, what people who are on fire with their faith uh, how we are. It's definitely showing them the truth and um, what society says or the secular world or what the media says about Catholicism when it's turned um, to a different way. We get to show them that no, this is how uh, Catholicism is and this is the greatness that it is and the love and uh, there's no judgments or anything like that. It's really showing people what the truth is and that's the incredible part of it to see that change in people. Let me ask you both, if we could, we just got a few minutes left, if you could each just address this quick. We'll ask you first, Father, about the importance of confession. I know Father Mark, you brought that up during the break, is the importance of confession in this whole journey. And, and really to try to you know, train at, as a, at a young age so that we carry it on into our adult lives and such. How important is that? How much is that emphasized down there? Uh, I was surprised, actually, when I got to the uh, St. Augustine's, the, that's the, the parish uh, the, where the Catholic Student Center is housed, that there was already established a, uh, the regular uh, practice of, of hearing confession. So we have two daily masses, Monday through Friday, and we've had confessions right before the 5.30 mass, Monday through Friday, five days a week, uh, you know, all the time, ever since I got there. Uh, but I remember a story, uh, I remember uh, being in the confessional uh, well, it was about a year ago, 
And somebody, th the first thing that the penitent said to me on sitting down was, thank God I got in here today. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and, uh, and the person said, well, this is the third day in a row that I have been in line <laughs> waiting to go to confession. Wow. And I was too far back. I was like one or two people too far oh, back oh. in the line with 45 minutes of confession five days a week wow. there uh, at the church. So we added more time for confession. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, they, I, I, I just see that the, the, the sacramental life, the, the liturgical life, uh, the, the level to which our students uh, really embrace and, and understand the liturgy, um, it's, um, it's, it's pretty amazing uh, and, and to that, see them at prayer. And that's the kind of stuff that's life altering. Mm -hmm. You know, it just changes us forever. Tanya, how about you? Uh, the importance of confession for a college student. It's everything. I mean, kids are waiting an hour before confession even starts to get in that line to have <coughs> confession. Like, it's crazy. But if I don't go to confession, I can't receive all of God's graces. I can't do all that I'm doing if I don't clear my conscience and if I don't um, make myself open to God. So the importance of confession will... I mean, it leads me closer to Christ, so without it. It reminds me back when, yeah. um, we've got to wrap this up here, I know, but St. <laughs> John Paul II, when he was in America back in the 80s, he said um, words to this effect, America, your confession lines are short, your communion lines are long, mm -hmm. let's fix it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, for real. More confessions. So it uh, <laughs> sounds like you're doing amazing work, and you'll be in our prayers. Just keep it up. Mission 10,000, right? Chomping. <laughs> those demons out of people's lives <laughs> for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Tanya, thank you so much thank for you your so time, much. for being here, and keep up the great work. And then, Father, we pass it to you so you can take us out as only you can do. And young men out there, we need laborers for the vineyard. You know, confessions need to be heard and sacraments need to be offered, so Amen. answer the call. May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you and give you His peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and His Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll see you next week. Awesome.